It's your girl, Miss Ruby V, and this is the Boom Bap Hour Uncut. I am here with a very special guest on the Ruby V exclusive. We have Houston White, a uh, fashion designer, founder of, uh, you know, North Minneapolis owned Houston White Men's Room, the Houston White brand, uh, doing real estate development. I mean, you're just doing all kinds of stuff all over place and I mean come on you are 1996 North Minneapolis alumni so only greatness could come out of that you know what I'm saying give it up for Houston White <laughs> <laughs> Respect. Well, thank you for having me it's, a, it's an honor it's a pleasure it's been a long time but it's always good to reconnect yes absolutely and you know this interview means a lot, not only because, you know, I love my hometown. I, I miss, I miss Minneapolis. I got to get back so soon so that I can, you know, visit with everyone and see everybody. But it just means a lot because number one, you are dedicated to making sure that you are generating, you know, wealth in our community. And I am dedicated to making sure that I, you know, uh, make sure that I give exposure to anyone who is doing that. So I'm just, you know, just let me personally say thank you for what you're doing for Minneapolis. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yes, yes. So you had a huge accomplishment last year. So let's talk about that. Um, the Black Excellence Collection was created exclusively for the reopening of the Minneapolis Lake Street Target. Uh, now, for those that don't know, for our listeners who, you know, are not familiar with what that actually, you know, um, represents, really that's the neighborhood that was ground zero in the long overdue racial justice awakening. Um, that target was really hit hard. Um, I don't know if you guys were watching the news, but, you know, that's where the windows were busted. You know, all of that went down at that target. So in that uh, civil unrest. So. Uh, really, it was very historical that it reopened because it was the basically the reopening of an entire community. So how do you feel being part of that historic event? Uh, it's just that, like, it's historic, right? I feel honored to have been tapped for that because, you know, most people don't know it started because folks were going to get milk, right? So they could get the um, chemicals out of their eyes. That was originally why, why those youngsters were running in Target to get milk. Mm -hmm. That led to some folks, you know, getting unruly with them. And then it catapulted into a complete destruction of that store, right? Because we came in to just get milk and we ended up being mistreated. And so it was just like this kind of enough is enough moment. And I gotta say to the folks at Target, you know, who decided that that store was essential. It was essential to the community, you know, who shops there, who needs that. And they made it a, a, a firm commitment that we're gonna reopen it. But the thing was, you can't just reopen a Target in the community like that and just do the same thing, right? Like that, uh -huh. and it feels inappropriate. And so they listen, what does the community want? How do we build a place that reflect the community? And so for me to have a brand that started in the basement when I was 12 years old, uh to be on those shelves and to be a part of something that was historic um and hopefully that 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 um contributes to a healing uh -huh. in the future it's colossal you know it was huge huge moment. absolutely yes so since then you even had more great milestones such as your collection premiering nationwide in jc penny you all walked in jc penny just looking to pick this shirt up, me and my husband, right? And I was like, hold on, wait a minute. That's his stuff right over there. Like, I ain't even expect you to have a whole setup like that. So, you know, he was like, well, let's go ahead and get some footage. So, you know, it's like, man, I, that was so dope to me. I was so excited about that. Um, and, you know, how do you feel about your clothes being not only premiered nationwide in JCPenney, but you were also featured in Forbes as well. So congratulations on that. Thank you, thank you. 
you know, the JC, so we did JC Penny last year. Um, and it was a, um, it was a test, right? Like, so the, the, the biggest moment last year was, was my mom being in Mississippi going in uh, to a store that wasn't necessarily welcoming to people who look like her years ago and picking up a shirt in Jackson, Mississippi and doing, getting footage and saying, this is my son's brand, right? And to, 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 for it to go so well last year that JC Penney's like, look, this is, this is huge. We need to do it bigger. And so we negotiated how this year would be. And it was like, we're gonna to have to be in partnership, front of store, right? This is gonna to have to be prominent and we're gonna to have to show what it's like to have allies, which is to be the change piece. And, and let's combine that with black excellence and tell a broader story about why I created this, what this means. And to, to, to get to sales figures, um, it's, it's humbling, right? Like mm -hmm. people responding. I've gotten so many personal uh, texts, even from folks I didn't even know. Like there was one cat, he was a white dude married to a black woman and they have uh, biracial children. And he's like, man, this is the first time I have a brand that can bring my family together in this unique wow. way. Sent me a picture and I was like, that was, I, that was epic. You know, and then the Forbes piece was like, you remember being in the halls of North. Um, I remember, you know, us dreaming about all kinds of stuff. We used to read the, um, the Source magazine incessantly, saying, like, oh, one day I want to be the unsigned hype or, you know, like all those things. We used to watch the videos and watch the Land Cruises, always saying we're going to get there, uh, the lifestyles of the rich and famous, all that, you know, the Rob Report. And so for <laughs> it was like this moment where it was like, all right, all the grind, all the work, all the hustle, all the ambition uh, recognized. Uh, by the tippy top of the tail. And so that was like, and for something that had purpose, right? It wasn't just like another dude balling. We don't need another boss, black man in the world. But when you're doing things with intention and they get recognized like that, that's pretty, that's pretty special. Definitely. And, and you know what? It's so funny because I remember some of those conversations. A lot of them conversations happened in that art class. So, I'm serious, you know, I mean, it, a lot of those conversations happen right there. And I just remember that and, um, you know, just just reminiscing about that time period and, and like really just everyone was in a place where we just wanted to see what, what we were gonna be. So, you know, that, that was pretty dope that, you know, we took that and, you know, you were able to catapult to, to another stratosphere, you feel what I'm saying? Yeah, that's what's up. It's, a, it's the American dream, you know, uh, honestly. Um, so. Yes, yes, most definitely. Now, um, so tell us all about what the Black Excellence brand actually represents so people really, you know, get the whole mission. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, it's a collective, um, just kind of a collective affirmation. <laughs> Black is excellent, period. Those two words. Um, belong together in my mind, right? We're talking about a people who, and, and when I talk about black, I'm talking about the descendants of enslaved people, black. But of course, it's welcoming to all our brothers and sisters, but there's a very specific experience that tr traumatic experience that my grandmother's mother's mother experienced. And I'm the descendant of that. And for the dignity uh, to be maintained, for um, the result of our community, which was raped and pillaged and destroyed and right to, to be standing here, that is some, 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 some godly magic that exists within the DNA of us that unfortunately a lot of us don't understand, celebrate, recognize. And so really for me, it was just the baseline. Like we are black, we are excellent. Let's celebrate that. Um, and then to move beyond that to say, well, with this platform of Black excellence, let's control our narrative, let's control our neighborhood, and let's build enterprises that can sustain us and build generational wealth. So it's just really like reimagining Black futures um, by paying homage to the Black past and understanding at a baseline, we don't need to be fixed, we Gucci already. We just gotta accept that mentally um, and then create a broader, better, uh, more intentional future. 
Absolutely. And <clears throat> tell us about your story. Um, you know, you shared your personal story of having a gateway from, you know, trying some stuff. I mean, I know a lot of people as teenagers, they try like maybe the illicit way of getting, you know, money to the legitimate way of getting money. Um, so, you know, and then you opened up, you know, you started doing barbering and H, uh, the HWMR men's room. So, uh, you know, the thing that I love is that you say you built it to be a bridge uh, between socioeconomic backgrounds. Everybody is going to their barber chair, you yeah. know, and that you're breaking and shattering generational curses. So tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so I, I think of the barbershop as a black man's country club. That's what I call it. It's our place where we are prominent, um, where we control the, 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 the space, the narrative, the photos, the conversation, everything. But it started for me um, at 13, 14 years old in the basement. Um, I cut friends hair, grew that business, became super busy. Um, in between cutting hair, printing t-shirts, designing t-shirts that we would sell in the halls of North High. Um, and so it was just this learning of our culture and, and your biggest critic, which at that time are classmates right and if they rock with you then you might got something that um that was like the best feasibility study i could have right like my 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 cohorts are like stamping their approval by doing business with me by purchasing and we would sell out regularly and so as i got older i always just had this affinity for what the barbershop represented for me personally which was freedom right? i didn't have to go punch a clock yeah, I had to, my, my customers are my boss, but I felt this liberated feeling like, almost like hustling on the block, you know? You give a service, you get a, you get a reward immediately. And so as I got older, I realized that my, my, my kind of superpower magic space was the barbershop, but how do I do that as an adult? And how do I also push it back out into the world as something that could unite people and also be a catalyst, you know, for a better black future. So essentially, like Nip said, man, what I have is a space that's rooted in culture, that's authentically rooted in culture, that's integrated vertically, you know, because that creates strength. And so that's kind of what I've tried to do with the connection to politics, to clothing, to various enterprises. Um, and yeah, I mean, that that's really, that's really what it's been about. It's like, a, 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 like LeBron hooping at 12, and then LeBron playing for the Lakers at 30. You know, it's the same kind of thing, but as you mature, uh, the connection to various um, parts of business, you know, kind of naturally happen, but you always stay true to what got you there. Absolutely. So do you feel like when, you know, men come together at the men's room that, you know, a lot of people talk about mental health these days, is it just a place for black men to come and just let it all out? Yeah, it's a safe space. You know, that's an overused word, but it's a safe space um, in that like every black man has a barbershop story or experience, remembers their first haircut. And I would, I would venture to say that most have a pretty pleasant experience. You know, it's like, you go in a space and you see all black men, right? Laughing, being free to talk um, from all varying walks of life. And then as you get older, you don't have a whole lot of spaces specifically for men to just kind of undoubtedly be and just, you know? You uh, don't. <laughs> and so it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's one of the few places throughout American um, history that's kind of remained intact and very specifically uh, what it was meant for is still what it exists as and it's still our place first and so yeah I think it's just no matter who it is whether it's Barack Obama or whether it's a little kid that maybe fell in school they all feel like they can go to the shop and just talk Absolutely. So you are literally building a place in Minnesota that will be closing that wealth, income, and achievement gap for Black people. 
So tell us about Camden Town. Like this is so dope to me. The, the basis of all American life, all human life really is place, right? Where are you from? Where you, what, 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 do you, what did you learn from the village that you were born into? And then what is your rites of passage, both financially, socially, emotionally, uh, spiritually, physically, that informs who you to become in the, in, throughout life? Um, we know that place for black people has been defined as the ghetto, the hood, right? Like all things that aren't really necessarily associated with safety and prosperity and goodness. You watch black movies, you know, things that we grew up watching from Boys in the Hood to Minister Society, it was always about the, 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 the degradation of, and the trauma that it just existed from just living, right? Like, you know, yeah. Like, that I don't think, and that I know, is not like what we want to be known for and as. And so right. I think about places like Harlem in the 20s, um, where because we had to be together, because we had no choice, we made the best of, of, of space. And because Black people emote culture, and we, may, we take something that was meant to destroy us and make it beautiful. We are the architects. Amen. So if you, if you say, well, of American life is place. Well, we are where we are. These stats exist. Disparities exist because of lack of place, lack of safety, lack of right generational excellence. So for me, the baseline to all of this is we have to re-resurrect that at place. And so Camden Town is the place that we're going to fuel and fill with culture that will catalyze Black excellence. Um, and that is the barbershop was rooted in black culture and space and to have brands and things that have scaled but have it relate back to a place. So when they say Houston White Camden Town, oh, what's Camden Town? Camden Town is this little place in North Minneapolis where this brand that's not all over the world originated. That gives that place some, 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 some dexterity, right? Like, I wanna know more. And then you start attracting people to move here, to live here. We got shared values, which is we want our kids to grow up safe and well-educated and, and, and in a prosperous environment. And we wanna have things in our neighborhood that reflect us, that benefit us, right? That we can play and work. And we have kind of this shared village like approach, something that I don't think has ever existed, at least for me in my time in Minnesota. Um, and so that's kind of the whole idea. Camden Town is a place of uh, black ownership, black wealth, black excellence. Um, and it's really like this burgeoning spot, this enclave of Black futurism. Man, that, that's so dope because, I mean, just thinking about like how when we grew up, it's like, you know, we want to be able to, to feel safe and, you know, have our kids feel safe and, you know, just like you said, have a place to just be and thrive. So. That is awesome. That is so awesome. So I know when I come up there, I'm definitely going to be visiting. So really? I'm excited about that. Yes. Definitely. Um, and another thing I think is wonderful is the beautiful way that you're paying tribute to, uh, you know, your wife with the Denise in White Legacy Fund. Um, and, you know, it's just a beautiful way that you're just paying tribute to her life. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so, you know, Donise is, is like, she's my muse, right? Like forever I'm inspired by her desire to be better. Um, and just her sheer regalia, right? Uh, the dignity that she had as a black woman. And so there were things that she shared with me about her own childhood, right? That she would like to have had opportunities to do, to see. Um, and so what I set out to do was create things that would make her proud uh, and affect the world in her name. And so Camden Town really was inspired by her as a Black woman who was desiring to leave Minnesota, right? Because it's not, not that So you can create a space that, when and if I get that right, and she's like, 
yeah, then I know that it's something special, right? And so I think about how do, how do I become a purveyor of, of opportunity? And if, if, if I can create businesses that do well, well, with the excess, I can create opportunities for kids and, and different people um, and do it in her name. And essentially that's what this is really all about is like the why is to honor and to create a different outcome for, for, for people of color, black people specifically. Uh, but then be informed by some of the things that we all maybe lack growing up. Um, and so that's really the idea. And you only die when people stop saying your name. Uh -huh. Yes. So it's, it's to keep, you know, her ideals and ideas and hopes and dreams alive. And then she forever is informing, right, through this kind of reverberating um, sense of hope and love and kindness. Oh, I do. The beautiful thing is, like when I was looking, you 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 recently posted something of, I think she she was talking about what, what the what is love, what the definition definition of love was, and I was like, that is so beautiful. Like you guys really inspired each other. Like you know, you were inspired by her, but she was also inspired by the man you were, you are, excuse me, you know, and how you just you know, definitely have no limits to what you believe that you can and will achieve. So, you know, I just think that is a, that's a beautiful thing. And just, you know, just keep posting and just keep, you know, just keep um keeping her memory alive. Cause I mean, that's a inspiration, you know, to, to others as well, you know, as far as just the legacy that you guys created together and that you continue to create, you know, in her name. So no doubt. It. I love it. Um, so you use hip hop often to drive the point of your mission home. Like you, you know, such as Jay-Z's quote, like you say, we all lose when we ain't got the tools. And it seems like you are dedicated to making sure that us as a people have the tools to succeed. So I want to ask you the question that I ask every guest on our show from every hip hop artist, you know, to every everyone that we have as a guest. So what made you fall in love with hip hop? Because I was there in a lot of them conversations. <laughs> I was there. What made me fall in love with hip hop? Hip hop is like a surrogate parent, you know? Uh, <laughs> it, it, we were born into it, right? It raised us. And I think we all, if you think, you know, hip hop really started to, to, to formalize in the 79, you know, and start to really become more prominent in the mid eighties when we were basically like 10, you know? And so it was for me, the soundtrack of my life. You know, I remember getting my first boom box, which was a little purple boom box. It was purple because of Prince. And I, you know, in okay. Minnesota, I, I had one tape and I broke it. I'm sure I did. It was a white tape. It was LL Cool J, the radio album. And I used to just be around with this purple boombox, walking all throughout Minneapolis. Just, that was my soundtrack, right? And so if you think about how, how interesting that is, you know, like that we literally were moving through day to day, going on walks with a boombox. Because as a people, we got this rhythm in our DNA that we don't really understand fully that comes from our tribal ancestry. And the beat is just like something that just makes you do what you do, but it's in a more of a modern context. So for, it's just, I think you was born into it, right? Like it's, it became the, the soundtrack of our lives, but it's really connected to who we are um, ancestrally. And, you know, you're hearing tribal rhythms just on an urban block. Yeah, most definitely. Um, and, and it's so funny because look, I would tell you, it's like, you know, Minnesota had their own, um, I don't know, maybe I can only speak for me, but I'm gonna tell you, it's like all the people that I was hanging with, they was on the West Coast thing. But for some reason in that class, being introduced to, you know, the love for Biggie, Wu-Tang, all of that, 
I'm serious, used to come from when y'all would talk about that. I didn't really know about none of that because none of my people, they was like Tupac all day, you know, it was serious. I'm like, well, I mean, damn, can I like me? I mean, is it is it a problem? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, but it was serious back then. People don't realize how really serious it really was but i mean it was just a a cool time it was a cool atmosphere and 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 i really can just um say that i I really learned a lot from just listening you know i didn't say much as you can see but i just (laughs) sat back and just listened to y'all and you know definitely just i used to just soak it all in yeah it's interesting It's, it's really interesting you bring that up because i remember being um in ninth grade uh and i um you know for, for a lot of people, it was different. You know, I had my shirt tucked in and a backpack on both shoulders. And I had a, um, a CD at the time. It was, it was Dell, the Funky Homo Sapien. Okay. And it was like, dude, this is weird, right? But for me, I always looked at like that music, like jazz music, the early formulation of jazz when bebop and, you know, some of the more sophisticated, I mean, it was all sophisticated, but I, I always, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of the late 50s, mid 60s kind of era um, of jazz, but like Thelonious Monk and, you know, so, so, so they were kind of off minor, right? They weren't like the, 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 the pop. Uh, a lot of West Coast music was, was sample heavy. So it was easy listening, right? Like it was just essentially you was listening to rhythms from our, our parents era and then they just rapped over it. You know, right, kind of, basically. Kind of Whereas a lot of the East Coast stuff was like a more complex wine, right? Like you, your, your palate has to kind of evolve a bit. And so you hearing a, a, a beat and it's just like, they're just playing horns and it's just some drums. Like that doesn't seem like, right? But until you evolve, and that, that was what was so interesting about that group of people. We were all, all kind of searching for more right and uh-huh. and that music was definitely like it was stretching us um because yeah i don't know that, that was really fun i remember having so many arguments with so many people uh and i remember the day um catching the bus downtown to um to the record store it was the day it was yeah it was the day that biggie dropped and also j rooted damager this was 90 Four. Must have been 94, because, yeah, yeah. All 94. And I remember I was going down to buy Biggie. I was going to buy okay. this movie, and I was on the bus, and uh, one of the OGs and I were talking, and we were talking about, uh, I didn't know J. Rue had dropped. And so he was like, man, that J. Rue was wild, B. Uh, you know how we, everybody was talking back then. God, you know what I'm saying? Now I cipher God that joins. <laughs> I was like, all right. And I ended up buying J. Rue the damage. And I remember getting back to the school. They were like, how you didn't buy Biggie? And I, I'll never forget what I like. I, I, it was like listening to a cinematic opera or something, listening to The Godfather, J. Rue the Damages album, The Sun Rises in the East. And I bought that over Biggie. But at that time, that, that oh my gosh. But those were those kind of decisions we were making as kids that, that were that seems so trivial, but was so prominent. Yes, 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 definitely. And you know, I mean, I was just watching the Wu-Tang documentary with my husband the other day, and it was just talking about how, you know, people, even like when, you know, people just didn't understand them at first, like, you know, they had a certain sound and, and people was like, wow. But once they understood it, it was like, dang, you know, like, this is dope, you know, this is like something that we've never heard before. Yeah. So, um, you know, I just think like, people like them were like pretty groundbreaking and, you know, it was just like really dope. And uh, like with the, like you said, the funky homo sapiens, right? Yeah, like, the funky homo sapiens. He was a part of, he was a part of the, uh, you know, the the whole crew uh, with the souls of mischief and the, the hieroglyphics, you know, they had, um, um, a few other like solo artists. It's been so long, but yeah, they were. But they were from LA though, right? They were Issa Rae before Issa Rae. <laughs> in the sense okay. that they had, you know, they were just like immersed in LA, but they had a very unique, different sound. 
Uh, right, Dale, right. That was Dell. Dell at that time was the method man of of that crew. You know, so he's okay. out. And they were talking about a lot of stuff, you know, the Asiatic and, you know what I'm saying? I mean, back then, I don't know what they were talking about. I ain't going to lie. I, <laughs> I didn't know what they were talking about. I was not on that. I ain't going to lie. But with wisdom and, you yeah. know, I, I ain't going to lie. My husband put me on to a whole lot of that, you know, and I was just like, oh, that's what they were saying, you know? So I was like, okay, it kind of made it all come together because I remember hearing it. but know I didn't really get it and come full circle at that time but it's just dope you know it, life just seems like sometimes it comes full circle wisdom comes later and hindsight is 2020 and it just makes you just look back at life and just be like wow this is why this happened this is why this happened and you know that's just how how life goes so um I'm just you know honored to had such a um such a cultural community and upbringing because you know um you know again i'm just so happy what you're doing for the city because we had mentors you know i mean like peyton you know i see here he's still you know doing a whole lot of stuff he was um our artist mentor uh who came into the classroom to mentor us and also you know brought us into his organization which was is still doing awesome things i see juxta juxta Oh God, I can't even say the word. Juxtaposition arts. Okay. Um, and it was just, it, it was just dope, you know, just to have some, let me tell you something. He was actually like, really, um, I thought about that a lot. Like um, when me and my husband, we also had like a kids uh, hip hop art program that we did down here in Augusta, Georgia. And I was just thinking that if somebody, you know, like that made an impact on our lives, you know, what can we do in other youth's lives? So it's just all about passing the baton and, you know, really making a difference. And I'm just, you know, just glad to be part of that nucleus. We're still connected today. I mean, we just uh, finished the, um, the side gussets for the get down coffee uh, bags that are going to be all over the place. And I wanted, for me, everything has to have some kind of story or some kind of authentic touch. And so I wanted those bags to be like any other coffee bag that ever existed and that they are works of art. And so we had, I had Peyton paint uh, paintings that would go on each side. And so he painted freestyle graffiti. One says get, the other says down. Um, oh. And then we scanned it. And so that, that's what's gonna be on the bag. So you will go into a Target or anywhere you see the Get Down Coffee Company, they'll have actual graffiti as uh, as work on the sides of those bags. And so he just did that and we're very connected. Um, and, and this is what this is all about. Like literally, you know how the, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Peyton was my first one-to-one. -one. 30 years later, we're still connected and working together and I'm benefiting him still. And he's still, I'm looking around now. I got one, two, three works that Peyton did just in the spot right now. And so that's just, that's, that's, that's astounding. To me. Awesome. That's so, so cool. Well, you know, um, we have a lot of people listening all over the world, worldwide, and we just want you to tell us where can we find everything Black Excellence, HWMR, Camden Town, where can we find out about all of these things? You know, probably the easiest place to find it is uh, HoustonWhite.co. Um, we also, CamdenTownMinneapolis.com uh, and on Instagram, HWMR.USA. Most definitely, yes. Will y'all hear that? Definitely go and check that out you will not be disappointed so any shout outs before we go ahead and wrap it up I man shout out to you for what you're doing thank you so much for uh for inviting me it's an honor it's always dope to just reconnect with folks um that you've encountered on your journey right and to check in and see where we are and the cool thing is that there is this through line that undergirds all of our lived experience and that is the connection to culture uh -huh. uh, never go away it'll never recede you know as we mature um we just have a deeper appreciation deeper affinity for it so 
shout out to you for keeping it alive and telling these stories. It's super dope, so I appreciate it. And you know, the whole community that raised us, that raised me, it just further laments this idea that it takes a village. Um, and it keeps me grounded in the fact that this is really the basis of human connection and how and why it always will be important. Awesome. Well, that's so dope. Thank you so much for being a part of our experience today. And, um, you know, definitely anytime that, you know, you want to come back on, let us know anything that you have going on. Again, look, I'm going to hold you up to that. We come up to Minneapolis, we going on a tour. No doubt. We can tour Camden Town. Tour Camden Town. Yes. So, you know, we want to have like a live a uh, broadcast from Minnesota, Minneapolis. That's going to be so dope to have. So um, definitely want to stay reconnected to that. And just congratulations on all your wonderful accomplishments. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, again, keep it locked, y'all. It's the Boom Bap Hour Uncut. Keep it locked. All right. Well, that's it, Houston. Well, thank you so much again. And, um, you know, we're going to edit everything. We're going to tag you. Please share it with everyone. I'm going to share it. I just want you to share it. And, um, you know, just let, let's let let everyone know about all the wonderful things you're doing, okay? Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Well, we'll holler at you. And it should be a couple, probably like a week, week or so, whatever, you know, get everything edited. But as soon as we do, um, we'll tag you and everything and um, all of that good stuff, okay? Oh. Thank all right. You. Peace. You have a great Sunday. Rest of your Sunday. Okay, bye. Bye. Let's go.